The People's Democratic Party releases timetable for national convention and activities leading up to the big event. An APC's leadership recognizes group campaigning for Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo to run for president in 2023. And this video now widely shared among Nigerians sparks outrage, which should rule modernization or tradition. Welcome to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa for another Monday morning here. I am Osaogi Ogbonwa. I always expect that, you know, Monday mornings will start up bright and early and of course it would come with some good news. But of course we live in Nigeria, so not very many of these uh, uh, times, you know, come with great news. And, and that's because of one of the things that we're starting with this morning on Off the Press, or, or rather on uh, uh, Top Trending Stories. We're taking, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're starting basically in Kwara State where there has been criticism for a video that went viral. Uh, there's a couple of angles that I'm going to share with regards to the story. Um, a place called um, uh, Madrasa, I hope I pronounced it right, it's an Islamic school that teaches the uh, preachings of uh, Prophet Muhammad. And, of course, you know, this video basically showed exactly what has been going on for a really, really long time in Nigeria, but nobody really spoke about it. Um, I'm sure we can quickly play that clip for you so you can uh, understand what I'm talking about. Yes, and uh, this is an example of some of the things that happened that went viral. These persons, of course, being flogged because they somehow flouted the rules of the Islamic school. They were accused of taking alcohol at a birthday party. Um, they say that they didn't take any alcohol, but of course, you know, you, I'm not sure if they did or didn't. Um, what's, you know, viral about it is the brutal flogging of these three persons, um, you know, that eventually went viral. The Quara state government has stated that a probe has begun into this incident and the leader of that particular Islamic school has been suspended. I'm not sure if, you know, the government can actually suspend him, but that's what the news is saying for now. Um, and so the different angles to some of all of this is how, you know, I've personally always said that, you know, religion has really just been a tool of control for mostly the poor, you know, and, you know, aside it being a tool of control, but it really only affects, you know, poor people negatively. I read a story yesterday of a person who said that he had a colleague who, um, you know, had sex with a cousin of his, um, the daughter of his father's brother. Um, and so when they found out, they took the two of them to, you know, part of the village. Um, and, of course, you know, the, the um, way to, of course, uh, uh, prevent the, the wrath of the gods on both families when something like that happens, so when incest happens, is to tie both of them in the bush for three days. But, you know, fortunately for them, one of them's father was very, very wealthy. And so somehow, some way, they made the gods understand that they don't need to tie them in the, in the bush for three days. They can instead buy two or three cows and put them in the bush for three days, you know, pay some money here and there. And, you know, those things would eventually be sorted. The gods would understand that these cows would, you know, replace the persons who uh, committed the... Uh, war crimes against their traditions and whatnot. Um, but that's for, you know, that's a situation where, of course, one person is very, very wealthy and can bribe, you know, the traditions or bribe his way or her way out of whatever religious, um, you know, expectations that there, there, there are. Um, and that's why I said, you know, religion really, yes, has been a tool of control, but sometimes it really only affects the poor people the most. Um, is it necessary? And at this point, do we also need to now be able to separate, um, you know, some of these traditional and religious practices, you know, separate them from what the Constitution says and what, you know, our laws, as people say, and which of them really should supersede each other? Um, can a person like that really sue for any reason whatsoever? Physical abuse, you know, um, harm, you know, bodily harm or whatever it is that the law says. Um, wh wh where really does the law stand? when, you know, religion has gone beyond, um, you know, the lines that it should cross. Those are some of the very, very important questions um, that you know, a lot of people need to start asking. And also, the power of social media. Because if this didn't get on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, a lot of people wouldn't even know that this happened. There wouldn't be any investigation today. And, you know, these people would have gone home, you know, to treat their wounds and move on with their lives. But, of course, there's an investigation by the Kwara State Government simply because this videos went viral. 
Um, and of course, got a lot of people talking about it. And so these are some of the things, you know, that you know, need to really, really be spoken about. But one final thing that I will say is how Nigerians are so used to abuse that you would still see these same persons continue to attend these schools and continue to be brutalized in this way, um, you know, because they believe it's a tradition and, of course, they should get punished for whatever crimes that they commit. And it is, you know, it is what it is. Um, Nigerians are used to abuse on many, many, many levels that they have zero idea what their rights are, what, you know, rights they should be always able to, to you know, fight for. And that's, you know, some of the things that I will mention. Abuse from government, abuse from the church, abuse from the Islamic schools, abuse, you know, from, you know, in their relationships, abuse from um, successive Nigerian governments. And that's why you see it. You're going to see some of all these things coming up in the next one year, where some of the persons that have abused Nigeria and abused the Nigerian state, you know, you know in very corrupt ways, have given Nigeria nothing or no level of growth whatsoever. Some of those persons, you still see Nigerians campaigning for those same people and ready for another four years of abuse and suffering and whatever it is, because Nigerians are used to abuse. And the same way, you would still see persons supporting, you know, what happened in that school and say, oh, well, you know, it's part of the tradition, so it's part of the laws of the school, you know, and that's, you know, the, the punishment when you break or flout some of these rules. It is mind-boggling, and I will never be able to wrap my head around how badly bitten the mindset of certain, of many, not certain, many, many Nigerians are that there's levels of abuse that they tolerate and, and they see as normal. And you hear it from even the learned. You hear it from people who have doctorate degrees, people who have master's degrees, people who you believe or you would expect should know better. They have been abused on that level that they don't even see anything wrong with abuse. We'll follow up on that story. And of course, if, if anything uh, new you know, uh, comes up from it, we'll definitely be sharing with you here on The Breakfast. Also on top trend in this morning, we move to the southeast now, where the IPOB in a statement has announced a ban on what they term Fulani cattle. Um, it was uh, a statement that was released over the weekend by the IPOB's head of directorate of uh, state, Mazi Chika Edosiem. Um, he discloses in a statement that, um, you know, within the next six months, there's going to be a ban on what they term Fulani cattle. And the only kind of cattle that would be reared in the southeast would be the Igbo cattle. Um, I can't remember the Igbo term for it. I, um, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but there's a term for, that they call it, uh, Igbo Kato. Um, that statement, of course, also went viral over the weekend with a lot of people, you know, some are green and saying yes, you know, because um, according to the statement, the Fulani cattle has brought in some of these marauders and people who have, you know, led to the death and killings and rape of people of the southeast. And so in order to stop those persons from coming to the southeast, you know, they would ban, you know, also, you know, the sale of all um, in, in court, once again, Fulani cattle. I'm not sure how much you know, of the Igbo cattle, or, the, you know, the, yeah, the Igbo cattle actually exists in the southeast. I'm not sure what species of uh, cattle that really is. Um, or if, you know, like some people have said, you know, the meat is sweeter, you know, the cows are bigger, some of all of that. I can't completely verify some of those claims. Or if it would be, you know, within, you know, possibilities that, you know, in the next six months, they will be able to replace the vast majority of cattle in all the cattle markets in the southeast, because there's many, many of them in the southeast. In Enugu, in, in Aba, in, in Anambra, many places in the southeast have their own cattle markets that are mostly run by, um, you know, people from the north. Um, but some other thing is, aside those people from the north who run those cattle markets and, of course, who come and trade their cattle, there's also businesses that have, you know, emanated that, of course, benefit people of the southeast. And so this, you know, may not just be for the, you know, cattle herders from the north um, who would get to suffer some of all these, you know, new laws or new bans here and there. Um, it, of course, they will affect people of the southeast whose businesses have been centered around selling of meat and, and cattle and whatnot. Um, also, if there is, you know, someone from the north who decides, okay, well, since you guys are banning Fulani cattle in the north, we're going to ban, you know, certain items that Igbo's trade in the north, then it's, it's obviously going to be chaotic across the country. Um, and that also may not, you know, be something that anybody is looking forward to. Two more things that I would quickly mention is the person, Mazi Chikai Dozim, who has put out this statement, who is the director of, uh, of a state, as it is called, for the IPOB, um, I can, you know, 
very likely tell you that he you know, doesn't also live in the Southeast, neither does he live in Nigeria. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because if you remember the Southeast governors not long ago put out some statements and said that most of the people who are giving these laws and these orders and making these statements um, to control IPOB members in the Southeast and let, you know, have led them to you know, commit uh, you know, crimes and chaos in the Southeast, most of the people who give out these orders don't even live in Nigeria. They don't get to suffer the effects of some of these things that they say. It's a Monday morning. Enugu very likely will be shut down today. Businesses wouldn't open. Many other parts of the Southeast would also be shut down simply because of the same IPO, IPOB order that they have, in quotes, denied and said that they you know, have called off. But of course, it doesn't seem very likely that it, you know, a lot of people uh, you know, believe in those statements. And so the Mondays will still be shut off or be closed down. The persons who gave these orders for Mondays to be, you know, sit at home, don't live in Nigeria, don't suffer any of the consequences of some of all these things. And that includes Chikai Doziem, the person who has now stated that in six months, there will be no sale of Fulani cattle in the southeast. Final point concerning this issue is the fact that um, I continue to ask and I've continued to point out the failure and the lack of actual government and respect for government in the southeast. For many reasons. One of them, of course, would be because the IPOB has been able to create a narrative and so to the people that your governors, your political leadership, both in National Assembly, local government level, state level, House of Assembly, have all failed. They're not there to represent you. They're simply there to enrich themselves. They've sold that narrative well enough. And there's a large number of people who actually believe in it, but because, well, there's many reasons to believe that. Um, many opportunities that the political leadership in the Southeast should have been able to speak up for the people and failed to do so. Um, many times when people have also looked out for, you know, simple amenities that don't even exist in the Southeast. Um, and so that, you know, narrative is easy to sell from the IPOB to the people. And you can then say that even those people who aren't necessarily IPOB members or don't even believe in the idea of Biafra would also agree that, yes, some of their points are valid. And so... Um, in the lack, you know, in the space where there's a complete lack of respect for political leadership because of what they've done to themselves. I mean, I'm talking of political leaders now um, and the way that they've positioned themselves in the last, you know, couple of decades. Um, when the IPOB then steps into that place and says, this is going to be our new law, a lot of people would simply comply because they don't expect that the political leadership or the traditional leadership or or anybody will be able to do better or speak on their behalf or, you know, take the, the mantle of leadership and actually, you know, do different. And so very, very many people do not believe or trust in the political leadership in the Southeast. And that's why these orders will continue to come. They can decide, you know, any time, any market day, that there's no longer going to be sale of onions, no longer going to be sale of tomatoes. In fact, they can decide that, you know, people should stop eating certain type of soups or certain type of stews. Um, any order that they feel like, they can even decide that there will be no marriage anymore in the Southeast. And people would say, yeah, well, yes, this is what the IPOB has said, and we will agree with it. Even those who do not agree would not want to be caught, you know, in the violence that, you know, might be the effects of, you know, disagreeing or going against the IPOB's orders. There needs, and there urgently needs to be some level of dialogue with the IPOB and the government, and of course I'm talking of the Southeast government and the Nigerian government, um, to ensure that some of this madness ends. Um, the reason there, is, there needs to be dialogue is because we can no longer, and Nigeria can no longer, in fact, Nigeria should have never really you know, pushed aside the idea of the IPOB and what they are fighting for, um, and acted like they don't matter, because obviously they actually do matter. Um, and some of the things that they are saying really creates a huge effect across the Southeast. And so let's see what the next six months brings. If yes, you know, people would actually stay away from, you know, buying, or from buying, you know, in quote, full any cattle. If, of course, some of those markets will be attacked, I hope not. If the government of the Southeast will be able to protect those markets because of the economic value that they also bring to the Southeast. If the governments of the Southeast will be able to step in, you know, and ensure that, you know, nothing like that actually happens and they protect people from the North who come to do business in the Southeast, mostly a uh, business of cattle. Our final top trending story, of course, is, you know, a good one for me, uh, simply because I expected that this would happen, and that is the victory of Tyson Fury against Deontay Wada over the weekend. Um, as expected, but of course, they went, you know, all 11 rounds. It was almost, you know, a 12-round, you know, fight. 
They got to the 11th round and Tyson Fury eventually came out winner, beating Deontay Wilder like he stole phone at Computer Village. Beating him, you know, black and blue, left and right, up and down. It was um, really interesting and beautiful for me to watch. And I'm sure a lot of people across Nigeria who are fans of boxing truly enjoyed this fight. It started very, very early on Sunday morning and, you know, was over by the time people woke up to go to church. A very, very interesting game of, um, uh, game of uh, boxing um, that, of course, produced for the third time Tyson Fury as a winner of that trilogy fight. Um, of course, now I've seen a lot of people and a lot of Nigerians advising Anthony Joshua, you know, that if he knows what's good for him, he should completely stay away from Tyson Fury, who can continue to bring, you know, the likes of Samuel Peters and Andy Ruiz and whoever else, you know, to fight with Joshua. But, you know, nothing, nothing should put him in the same ring with Deontay Wilder or uh, Tyson Fury. And that's the best advice, no matter who is advising Anthony Joshua, you know, his coach, his babalao, the pastor of his church, anybody who was advising him to completely tell him to stay away from the ring uh, that has uh, Tyson Fury or Deontay Wilder in it. Uh, and of course, I would also give kudos to Deontay Wilder for going all 11 rounds. His legs were weak for, you know, majority of, you know, that fight. He, of course, you know, got burnt out um, and eventually lost the fight. Um, and one other thing, of course, that I would mention is one thing that I love about Tyson Fury is the energy um, that he brings, uh, the perseverance, and of course, the things that he says also. If you listen to the post-match uh, uh, commentary where they both were interviewed, where he was interviewed, he spoke about you know the fact that no matter how many times you you know you get knocked down, because he was knocked down twice in the fourth round, no matter how many times you get knocked down, what's most important? is that your mind and your body and yourself know that you should always be able to stand up and keep fighting for whatever it is that it is that, that you're fighting for. Remember to always stand up and continue fighting until you get what you want. And of course, he also finished the game by singing uh, a song in the ring. If you remember last year after the fight, he did a song by Madonna, American Pie. This time, I'm not sure who did the song, you know, but the song was titled Walking in Vegas. He also performed that song right after the fight. Beautiful from Tyson Fury. Those are our top trending stories this uh, Monday morning. One, welcome once again to The Breakfast. We'll take a short break. When we come back, Off the Press comes up next. What major stories have made the headlines across the nation this morning? We'll be sharing with you.